Good evening and uh, welcome to our session on compliance for higher education, exploring a case study in a successful implementation of the CMMC program. So as we are all well aware, higher education institutions collectively receive billions in annual DOD research funding, making them obviously subject to DFARS and often ITAR requirements for controlled unclassified information. With CMMC, the implementation and the Department of in implementation and the Department of Education's imminent notice of proposed rulemaking, which is a federal rulemaking process that is expected to mandate NIST 800-171 compliance for student financial aid and personally identifiable information, which will be considered CUI, the urgency for institutions to adapt has never been greater. In today's webinar, we will showcase how Virginia Tech's Applied Research Corporation successfully navigated the challenges of implementing uh, NIST 800-171. And this culminated just last week in a very successful CMMC compliance assessment conducted by a certified third-party assessment organization and the Department of Defense's DIBCAC, uh, which is an acronym for the Defense Industrial Base Cybersecurity Assurance Center. Leading up this assessment was Dr. Matt Wolf, who is our distinguished guest today. Matt serves as Vice President for Technology at Virginia Tech Applied Research Corporation, where he leads the organization's technology development strategy and commercialization initiatives. He's got extensive experience in the intelligence community, previously served as a civil servant focusing on Technology development and technical operations, his expertise extends to supporting medical diagnostics, special operations forces programs at DARPA, and beyond. Dr. Wolf has a PhD in biochemistry and biophysics from the University of Minnesota and completed his fellowship in the National Institute of Health. His contributions have advanced multiple technology development programs and he brings a unique blend of technical expertise and strategic leadership to VTARC's compliance initiatives and is no doubt one of the stewards for ensuring success of the program. Welcome, Matt, and thanks so much for joining us and for leading VTARC to a very successful um, CMMC assessment. Thank so you, Sanjay. Thank you very much. So let's dig right into it. Um, We'll start with what are the unique compliance challenges that higher education institutions face compared to other sectors? Yeah, thank you again, Sanjeev. This is a great opportunity to, to share this experience. Um, and uh, so, so looking at university environment, I think uh, there's a few, few unique challenges for sure. Um, and comparing them to small and even large businesses um, that, that typically they may not face. Um, one is the, the diverse nature of the higher education um, operations. Um, it can make it very difficult to track the data flows and data protections needed uh, by the many user groups. So not only do you have the operational units like HR and, and your sponsored programs and things of that nature, intellectual property, uh, but you also have the individual research teams. And, and you think about a university, it's it's not necessarily aligned as a collection to produce a single product or a family of products. Um, these are very um, diverse groups in nature. They're kind of running their own path and, and uh, doing their own thing. So it makes it very difficult to kind of track and, and keep track of who and what needs to be compliant. Um, looking a little bit more specifically at the research activities, they can be, there could be numerous, numerous non-corporate or you know, sort of decentralized information systems. Uh, both cloud and on-prem, which makes it a challenge uh, when you're trying to achieve compliance. Um, and oftentimes these are maintained by the researchers themselves. And compliance isn't always, of course, at the forefront of their mind. They're thinking about their uh, their research and their focus there. Um, 
And I would say, lastly, the, the very nature of scholarship is one of collaboration, which is great. It's what pushes science forward, um, but often without boundaries and certainly boundaries that can be, uh, you know, that are digital in nature and they can be crossed easily. So all of these are, are challenges for the CIO and, and the team to sort of track and um, ensure there's a good strategy in place to, to achieve the compliance. Uh, it's a story that we hear um, quite often and I think is common to higher ed. Um, and so I think, again, they'll find your perspectives and your experience particularly valuable. So I'm going to now delve into what catalyzed Virginia Tech's um, decision to undertake the Comprehensive Compliance Initiative, and when did your journey begin? Yeah, I think that, so, you know, compliance, um, you know, in, in going after different certifications, SOC and all those others, um, it's always sort of been on the back of mind. We're a, a small group, um, but we knew we are at some point we're going to have to <laughs> launch into this, obviously, as the threat becomes even greater, uh, you know, out there. So, uh, but I would say we, we really began thinking in earnest about it um, back in around 2019 when both the interim rule uh, requiring self-assessment came out. It was also about the time that VTR was transitioning from a predominantly on-prem environment to a largely cloud-based environment. And so we knew there were going to be some major changes in our infrastructure and how we operate. So that's when we decided that we have to really take a look at this now and, and get moving on it. Um, I would say that having worked with the government, uh, we do a lot of defense contract. Um, we knew that what we were hearing at the time wasn't necessarily going to be the final state. And that's that's proved true, uh, you know, version one, version 2.0. Um, but the real catalyst, I would say, was the in really getting us moving on was the release of the, the version 2.0. Uh, and we also started seeing a greater use of CUI, uh, that term, not just in, in sort of some of the, the, the DFARS clauses and such, but in our contracts, in our defense um, security documentation. So such as a DD-254, um, they may not be asking for secure um, classified environments, but they certainly say we have to protect CUI in there, which is sort of a way around having it embedded within the clauses themselves. So... Your team, as you looked at moving to the cloud, which is again a global you know, initiative, um, wisely opted to develop a compliant enclave. Could you walk us through the strategic considerations that shaped your approach um, of embracing a compliant uh, mm -hmm. enclave? Sure. So we are a relatively small organization as part of the university, the larger uh, infrastructure. But so I would I have to be honest to say that that cost is certainly one of those components. I mean, we already knew that the assessment itself every three years was uh, estimates were going to be in the you know the twenty k range. Uh, but those estimates over the years have have, have actually spanned a, an order of magnitude. So we knew cost was going to be a consideration, but we didn't know how big of a cost consideration it was going to be um, early on. And so that unknown of that, um, uh, not just to reach compliance, but also maintaining and verifying com compliance on an ongoing basis was a big concern. Um, so what we be did is we, we started out with an internal assessment of our systems to find out, you know, you know where we have what aligns with NIST controls already in place and, and what systems are really reliant or will be needed um, to, to manage CUI. And so that really led to the strategy of that decision. Is this going to be an enterprise endeavor or is it going to be an enclave approach? Um, so that early uh, sort of, I, I don't want to confuse it with self-assessment because that means something else um, with, with NIST 800, but we had to do an internal assessment of our, of our holdings and our processes and our workflows and what needs to be protected. Um, at the conclusion of that, you know, a relatively confined environment seemed to be uh, what would what would work best for us without affecting our operations and our research too much. Um, so it made uh, you know it sense in the end to pursue the compliant enclave. Um, I'd say that you know some of the things that we went through and others should I would recommend consider is not just you know so the diversity of your user, your user groups. As I mentioned, if you have multiple research teams that are all endeavoring in this in this world or working in this world, um, and that, that'll dictate what kind of an environment you need, the size and scope of the information uh, system environment needing compliance. So think about the number of end users on-prem cloud and also current capabilities that are in place. Um, also the proportion of your operational activities that will require compliance. Um, for us, the preponderance of our work um, is, is supporting Department of Defense. So that was a big factor for us. Um, 
And then the impact on multiple environments, uh, on using multiple environments, such as an enclave and then sort of more commercial systems, that, that is going to impact users. So that's just another consideration that you should measure. It's how disruptive might it be, um, case may be, uh, for the users. And then, of course, the status of your documentation. Documentation, it turns out to be a, a bigger deal than we we may have anticipated early on. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I'm having about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, having an understanding of your documentation is is another thing that that one might uh, certainly consider when you when you're making such a decision. So I think uh, what's interesting is that um, you know, your uh, we've been obviously advocating for um, enclaves and to limit the uh, number of people that have access to the CUI for as you know, um, many years now. Today, we had the privilege of having Dr. Ron Ross, who authored NIST 800171 as one of the guests on our CMMC summit. And he his advocacy is for the same thing. He says, limit the number of you know, endpoints that you have and you know, go for more of an enclave-based approach as opposed to enterprise-wide. So I think um, it's kind of nice for us uh, to hear that as a perspective of the the standards author as well. Um, yeah. I have one uh, question to ask on the um, your you know your endpoints. Did you by any chance have high performance computing clusters um, also as part of some of the things that you wanted to get compliant or or not? Yeah, not not. Uh, I'd say no in that case. And what we did is we made a decision as we were making that transition from largely on prem, where we I wouldn't say we had high uh, you know HPCs, but um, we uh, we went to the cloud. Uh, we we selected AWS, and um, because we have some government sponsorship, we went with GovCloud in some instances. Yep. Uh, so so that was the route we took um, in just building out our environments there, um, as opposed to having on-prem. But I know a lot of other institutions certainly have um, their own on-prem compute environments, and um, again, I think getting a handle on the number of those and who's using them and what what types of work is being done on them is is going to be critical rather than just saying across the board oh we've got to get all of these compliant i don't think that has to be the case um, and so you can you know establish a few of those enclaves um, within those environments um, and uh, working across those environments would probably be a a, a wiser approach um, than just it'll be a lot less expensive <laughs> I know. And I think that's, uh, uh, again, very sensible because what what's interesting is, yes, there have been HPC clusters in on-prem and so forth, but now with, again, on GovCloud and other, you know, clouds, we've got the ability to spin up these kinds of computer environments. And I think those enormously simplify the compliance initiative versus, you know, the legacy mode of having everything um, you know, on-prem. Mm -hmm. So now moving on to our next, um, you know, question, which deals with um, some of the key milestones in your compliance journey. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us a bit about the team structure and some of the key decisions that you made. Um, walk us through the key steps and milestones as you uh, march towards your uh, assessment last week. Sure. So I'd say, let me just start with a team. Um, we're a small team. We have a, an, I have an IT director, one sysadmin and a help desk technician. I mean, that's really it. Um, but we also have an outside individual uh, as a consultant. He actually was our former IT manager uh, who went out on his own, but he's very uh, security minded. And so he's, he's working part-time with us, but um, we're all hands on deck. I mean, that's just really the bottom line there that, that this is an important thing that we, in a, in a overall milestone at, uh, for us as a company, uh, you, know, you know, achieving this compliance. So we, we didn't, we, we didn't want to fall short or kind of try to skim by, um, because we went with prevail, um, and, and the compliant enclave, I, I'd consider your technical team as a member of our team. They've been with us throughout the process, um, sharing information, uh, about the, the platform itself. Um, and they were invaluable during the actual assessment, which I can get to a little bit later. Um, uh, providing that critical information has been um, quite important to us. I would say that, um, it, you know, some of the defining milestones would be, as I mentioned earlier, assessing your own environment and data protection needs. I mean, you should have an understanding of that anyway, um, just as, as good security uh, practice, but um, with the optic of 
okay, how is this going to impact our, our subsequent decision making? Um, determining the enterprise versus the enclave protection uh, approach was a big decision that included finance, you know, our finance team as well um, as our security team and, and others um, all chiming in on that. And then once we had, had made that decision, um, we wanted to perform an internal compliance self-assessment. And so if you're familiar, with, you know, this folks are familiar with the SPAR system, um, you do that self-assessment. And I will say that was a, a big, it was a milestone, but it was also a shocking one. Um, because what I wanted to do, despite confidence in our team, is I wanted to have a third party come in and perform an assessment, not like a C3PAO necessarily, but um, just give us a sort of a outside approach, uh, uh, our view. Um, very drastically different numbers, <laughs> I would say. And the third party gave us, uh, uh, I'd say, a lower score, and I won't tell you by how much, but uh, certainly a lower score. So. That right there was a wake up call. Um, and the next big decision point was for us to acquire a third party uh, a team, a consulting team um, that were actually, I think they're now a C3PAO, but at the time they were not, but they're, they live and breathe this environment and they're following the rule, uh, you know, uh, rule changes and all of that quite closely, things that we just don't have the time to do. Um, so they walked us through all of the necessary controls and documentation. They actually recommended a piece of software that we, we brought in where we could share information and it actually calculates, recalculates your score as you go along. So that was a big, a big activity for us. And, and I would say the next milestone was just having that confidence in our, our score. Um, and then being able to, uh, you know, reach out to a handful of C3PAOs um, they, and I would say even before you go under contract with one of them, it's helpful just to have the conversations with them. You're going to get different perspectives. Um, that's one of the pros and cons of, of this whole uh, new system that, that's being put in place is um, you have all these competing companies that are trying to trying to help teams like ours. Um, but at the same time, you're going to get a variety of opinions. Uh, you're going to have tough scores. You're going to have easy scores. Right. And so you never know what you're going to get. So have those conversations early to feel out um, the, the teams um, that will in the end be, you know, helping you through the process. Um, so once we identified them and engaged with them, they had encouraged us to go ahead and apply for the, the Joint Surveillance Voluntary Assessment Program, which we did. It took us about three to four months to schedule that. Um, so once that was scheduled, again, another we hit another milestone. We, we, we now have, we kind of see the end of the, the light at the end of the tunnel, if you, if you would say. Um, and as you mentioned, we just completed the assessment last Friday. So um, we're, you know, we're hot off, off the process. Off the press. So, which makes yeah. this very timely. Um, uh, I'm going to jump into yeah. that, but I also want to um, offer up to the listeners over here that uh, the point that Matt brought up about speaking to multiple you know, C3POs is, again, a wise one. And um, we have, again, a dozen of them um, at the CMMC Summit today. But in case you missed that, uh, uh, please contact us at Prevail. We'd be happy to set up um, you know, introductory calls with uh, multiple C3PAOs that you can um, use to evaluate your strategy and your programs. So now um, moving over to the big week, uh, which was last week, and uh, the CMMC JSVA program, which stands for Joint Surveillance Voluntary Assessment. Tell us, Matt, what is this JSVA certification program, and why did you choose it, um, and what was your experience with the assessment? Sure. So I would say the timing of it and why we chose it is, um, we had spent a lot of time thinking about this problem um, or challenge, I would say, of getting this approved. And and even though that, you know, the most of the defense contracts out are, the, you know, they're, you know, these they're going to be releasing the requirement over time. But we wanted to just get get it done with, to be honest yeah. with you. And so this was a sort of an early opportunity to get it done. And then it also gives us time that if if we really underperformed in it, that we would have. Um, some time uh, to make corrections and to get our systems squared away um, before the preponderance of contracts have all of these clauses in them and essentially eliminating opportunities for us. So we didn't want to, we wanted to have some, some, uh, some, uh, some length uh, of time to, to work that out if it became an issue. So um, as I mentioned, you know, working with the, in the process, working with the RC3PAOs was, was incredibly helpful. 
Um, they had been trained in the, you know, in the process, very helpful in preparing us for the certification process, uh, as well as, you know, I mentioned earlier the your, uh, Prevail engineers um, being available, um, talking through um, some of the things we've been hearing and, and uh, things we're going to have to demonstrate. Um, they're very helpful there. Um, the assessment itself was was scheduled for one week, so it started on the 21st for us, uh, of October. Um, the first three days were all virtual meetings. Um, it's it's where both the C3PAO and the and the government team, the MCAC, um, were on the calls. They were just pe- going through sort of methodically all of the controls and looking for that demonstration, those artifacts proving um, that we have those controls in place. Um, so anywhere from sharing a screen and logging in, you know, two-factor authentication or single sign-on, whatever the case may be, and just walking through those. So that was over about a three-day period. Um, then we had on the fourth day, it was a site visit. So the, they came on for about half a day, on site for about half a day. Um, they got to see the access control. So some of the physical controls, like uh, access to the systems, um, you know, who, 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 how many admin folks uh, or people with admin privileges there were and, and what's where are the protections put in place there? Um, they actually interviewed a few of our key staff. Um, they actually didn't interview me, um, which was fine. Um, they talked with our HR manager, for example, our contracts director. So these are they have it sort of people that are um, in these roles that have to protect information, but aren't necessarily in you know working on the defense research and development and, and working with the controlled information necessarily directly, although. They obviously they do when it comes to the PII and things of that nature. So, but we had all of those folks um, properly trained on SOPs and, and and able to handle the questions that came out. The fifth day was essentially a summary discussion and wrap up. Um, so the the assessors then are, are set. Probably in about three weeks, we should get an outbrief from them on their findings. Although we we were collecting and taking notes throughout the process on and things that, that that they were picking up on. Um, but then in the end, we have a POEM in 180 days really to comply and get a, a follow-up assessment just to, to make sure we've checked all the boxes and then we should be good to go. So, Well, uh, again, congratulations. As we, We're not going to talk about your scores, et cetera, but we understand <laughs> that you did really, really well. And uh, we, we, will, uh, we will let you announce those things uh, later. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about, you know, the role that, uh, you know, Prevail played. We were your partners in uh, providing the end-to-end encrypted email, file storage and sharing platforms, and also documentation. Could you speak to, uh, and I promise you this is the only, you know, Prevail-related question, uh, mm-hmm. on how did Prevail, you know, meet your needs, um, both on the platform um, to protect CUI and also on the documentation uh, as well? Sure. Yeah. And, and even before we went through the assessment, we had some questions from our partners about um, the prevail system and because they wanted to send us information, protected information and um, having that documentation and sending it over addressed all of their questions immediately. So that was great um, being able to do that. Um, uh, so it, I would say that the platform itself and in has in, been working great. Um you know, our the the number of users we have on the system is growing um, as we're of course seeing more and more CUI being being shared. Um, but we haven't had really any issues um, at all. I mean, there's been a few a few things that come up, which is usually on our side, um, user error. Um, the the customer support's been great, so those have quickly resolved. Um, but we haven't had any. The only I would say the only issues we have, um, particularly with when it comes to like what we call spillage. Is usually the government who are just learning to spell CUI. Oftentimes, they're you know they're they're still an FOUO and they they're using other acronyms oftentimes. And as part of their op tempo, they're just sending stuff um, CUI just to our regular email system. So the real learning curve, once we had all of our folks trained up on using Prevail, is to get the government folks to say, okay, we need to please pause. Um, help us be compliant by um, by making sure that you use the system appropriately and and there so we can set we've set up um, secure emails um, that go right into the prevail system that our government partners can use um, and then also I would say that um, that having those those SOPs is important so you can't just put up a, th- uh, a platform like prevail in place 
and as user friendly as it is, just to, it's not going to work itself. You know, in the end, there are users that have to engage with it, and they have to be um, trained. And it's not it's not heavy. I mean, if you can if you can work Outlook or Gmail, you can work Prevail. <laughs> so it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, but you just yeah, you know, it just have those in place. You're going to need them anyway for the assessment. So you might as well um, get folks. Um, you, you know, using, you know, whatever system you're using, getting them using it appropriately and consistently. But um, we, we haven't had any issues and uh, it's been a great tool for us. And, you know, again, wanted to be a bit more clear about documentation. Documentation is the heart of the assessment. And, you know, certainly that is a big ticket item for, you know, the cost associated and the time spent to develop it. And so we do our part in being probably about the only company that provides a, a very robust set of documentation. Um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, did you use the documentation? Was it helpful? Um, any thoughts associated with that? Yeah, okay, yeah, absolutely. It was helpful. Um, we, you know, we have to, the, the big thing is, is it's, it's from our perspective, it's a third party platform, right? And, um, and you all, it's been a trusted partner. Um, so, we we rely on that documentation and uh, during the assessment in particular to talk to the platform itself and what what's in place there. We, you know we can't open up the guts of the system and show everybody, so we rely on it. And we have not had any issues whatsoever. It's 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 complete, it's thorough, and and addressed the 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 questions that that came up. I mean it's a trusted system. So um, I would say. That there's that set of documentation, that, that the technical documentation, and that has been, I would say, just flawless in terms of, of supporting um, our activities and going through the assessment. Um, and then there's the whole the whole set of documentation that we have to build. That's that every organization is going to have to build it specific to them. But having the prevail prevail documentation to lean on as a as essentially in that case support documentation has been incredibly helpful. So. Um, I think that that's um, something that, you know, as, as folks are looking at how they're going to implement and what they're going to implement, um, having not just a, a platform or application available, but but the, the, the development team and their knowledge is incredibly important and in how that's translated into documentation so others can can understand it as well is quite quite important. So I think now that we immediately expect you to have this under the belt, um, you know, uh, what do you foresee as some metrics that you'll establish to, you know, ensure that you remain compliant? Because it's an it's a continuous journey. It's not like a one time and then forget about it. So tell us sure. about how you're approaching that. Um, yeah, I would say you know compliance is it's important, um, but as we've said and we've had to talk to our board about. Um, having CMC, CMMC compliance alone doesn't protect you from all of the threats that are out there. It's a piece of it. And as you say, maintaining it, compliance and maintaining those underlying systems that are part of those controls uh, are all important. So we're largely tracking um, system use. So uh, we know our use is going to grow. Um, any spillage that occurs, um, you know, we have to report those anyway. Um, security issues in general. So are we, are we doing a good job in terms of protecting the data in our systems? Um, but also any issues related to controls um, that are in place um, that we, we this is important because our end users, if they're complaining, not being able to reach a website or do this or do that because of these controls that are in place, um, they're going to complain or it, we have we have to fight that battle um, in, in, you know, to make sure that we're um, uh, complying and being secure. But we also have to monitor that because that's going to tell us how users behave. If they're very unhappy, they might start cutting corners. They might not be following SOPs. So it's a good um, sort of qualitative measure of performance, I would say, is how well and how well people will be complying with SOPs is, is, is sort of the complaint box. Well, Matt, um, the very last question as we come to the end of this incredibly helpful uh, webinar is uh, any surprises um, that uh, you encountered either during your journey or during the assessment? Uh, and what advice would you give to institutions just starting their uh, compliance process right now? 
Sure, sure. I would say the assessment um, was not a surprise because of all of the conversations we had leading up to it. So Great. that was good. Um, the documentation, I think it, it's still surprising the depth that they go in. And, and just a couple of examples, we had to put a CUI sticker on our printer. Never, it was, there's no control for that, right? <laughs> but but it's something that that, that came out of the conversations. Um, and, and so those 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 sort of one-offs are was a, were a bit surprising. Um, I, I would say the best advice I, I, I can give is to get started sooner rather than later. Um, get talking to those experts, uh, the C3PA is the, the vendors like yourself, um, and start asking questions. But don't you, you're not going to be able to learn everything yourself, so you have to rely on them. Um, there's too many changes in these it, it, too often because the threat the threat environment changes yeah. so much too. So uh, I would just say get started early and, and be thorough. That's probably the best advice I can give. Well, again, uh, thank you so very much, um, Dr. Wolf, for sharing uh, Virginia Tech ARC's um, experience, which I think is invaluable for other educational institutions. Congratulations on successfully uh, navigating the CMMC compliance journey. Um, and um, your team's journey offers a practical roadmap for higher education institutions facing similar challenges. So we really appreciate it. We also want to communicate that Dr. Wolf um, has graciously um, offered up um, to speak uh, to CIOs and CISOs in the audience that may wish to have questions for him. Kindly reach out to us at Prevail and uh, we will be happy to connect you. And with that, um, again, thanks a lot. Congratulations and uh, good luck uh, with your continued journey. Great, thank you, Sanjay. Thank <laughs> you.